Last time we covered some basic linear transformations such as scaling and rotation. However, we've left the offset as a separate final addition performed by the vertex shader. It would be convenient if we could also represent the translation transformation in matrix form as well. But a translation clearly does not satisfy the property that for a linear transformation the origin must remain at zero. So therefore, it is not possible to represent an X and Y translation using a 2x2 two two matrix. However, by being a bit clever and increasing the dimension, we can actually represent a 2x2 two two translation with a 3x3 three three matrix. First, to represent any position vector, we add a third component with value 1, and then we extend the prior matrix to be 3x3. Three this 2x2 two two portion is the same old linear transformation without any changes. Next we have the first two components in the third column which specify the x and y offsets. Multiplying by this matrix will effectively apply a linear transformation followed by an offset. If we expand out the multiplication we can see this takes on the form of the calculation we were already using in the vertex shader. Finally, this fixed third row simply will copy the value 1 from the position vector into the transformed result. This family of transformations is known as affine transformations, and this way of implementing affine transformations by adding an extra dimension is called homogeneous coordinates. One disadvantage of the previous method is that the translations would always be applied as the final step. But with affine transformations, we can interleave translations in with the other linear transformations. For example, currently whenever we rotate an object, it can only rotate around the origin. But some of the time, it would be useful to be able to rotate around an arbitrary point known as the anchor. With affine transformations, this is much easier to do. First, translate the object so that the anchor point moves to the origin then rotate the object and finally translate the anchor point back to its original position. Combining these three transformation matrices together using multiplication will result in the desired transformation. However, a distinction arises when we need to transform vectors that represent directions or relative offsets rather than positions. The distance between two corners of a square is the same regardless of where the square is placed. However, if the square is rotated or scaled, then this relative offset is affected. So if we are storing this relative offset value in a variable, we want it to be affected by linear transformations applied to the square, but we do not want distances to be affected by translations. Homogeneous coordinates can easily account for this by encoding any vector that does not represent a position with a zero as the third component so that it's not affected by translations, but will still be affected by other linear transformations. This can be shown to be true by multiplying out a transformation matrix by a vector, because the third component of the vector is zero, when multiplied by the third column of the matrix, the translation values are canceled out, and the homogeneous coordinate value is carried over. So using this system of homogeneous coordinates, a vector v equal to 3, 2, 1 would represent the position at 3, 2, and a vector u equal to 3, 2, 0 would represent a displacement or a direction. Now, all of this applies just the same for three dimensions. If we have a position represented by an x, y, and z component, we can add a fourth homogeneous coordinate and use 4 by 4 matrices when working with three-dimensional geometry. This is why you will commonly see many 3D graphics libraries and engines using 4x4 matrices. When working with transformation matrices in three dimensions, the linear transformation portion will be 3x3 three three, and the fourth column holds the translation component. So in this tutorial, we're going to update our engine to render 3D objects. It may be a good idea to create a copy of your project if you want to have a 2D version of the engine to come back to since from this point on we're going to focus mostly on 3D rendering. Okay, let's start coding. In the game object implementation file, I'm going to rename the transform2d component to just be transform component. 
Next, update the type of the translation and scale properties to be a VEC3 instead of a VEC2. And update the scale properties constructor with a third argument also with the value 1. Now, in three dimensions, it is no longer possible to specify an object's orientation with just a single value. We actually require at least three. So change rotation to also be of type GLM VEC3. Get rid of the mat2 function and add a new function with return type GLM mat4 called mat4. We are using 4x4 matrices here because we have three spatial dimensions plus one more for homogeneous coordinates. Okay, so the GLM vector library has some built-in helper functions we can use to easily construct 4x4 transformation matrices, which we can get access to by including the GLM slash GTC slash matrix underscore transform dot HPP header file. Then inside the mat4 function body, initialize a new local variable with auto transform is equal to glm translate with the first argument being a 4x4 identity matrix and the second being the translation property. This creates a 4x4 translation matrix using the transform component's current translation values. Then to combine this with a scale transform, we have transform is equal to glm scale with the transform local variable as the first argument and the scale property of this transform component as the second. And then on the next line, return the transform variable with return transform. The way to think about how all these glm matrix functions work is by treating the first argument as the left hand side of a matrix multiplication. So for example, the scale function returns the result of the transform matrix multiplied by a scale matrix constructed by using the VEC3 scale argument. Note that the actual implementation of the scale function is more optimized than computing the entire matrix multiplication. We're not done yet though, we still need to apply the rotation transformations. Rotations are much more complicated in three dimensions. When working in 2D, there only exists one possible axis of rotation. But in 3D, we can rotate about any arbitrary three-dimensional vector. Euler angles are one way to represent an object's orientation in three dimensions by using three values which represent a rotation about one of the coordinate axes. A rotation about a coordinate axis is called an elemental rotation. So an elemental rotation can be about the x-axis, y-axis, or z-axis. By composing three elemental rotations, any target orientation can be reached. There exist 12 possible sequences of rotation axes divided into two groups. Proper, or sometimes called classic Euler angles, use the same axis for both the first and third elemental rotations, with there being a total of six different possible proper Euler angle combinations. The second group is known as Tate-Bryan angles which represent rotations using three distinct axes. For example, x, y, z, or y, z, x, and so on. With there also being a total of six different possible combinations. All 12 of these orderings are equally valid. But I think it is more common for game engines and other 3D graphics programs to use Tate Bryan over proper Euler angles. Such as in Blender's Object Properties tab. In the transform component, you can select which rotation mode you want to use, and you can see listed here the six possible combinations of Tate Bryan angles. Additionally, there exist two other commonly used representations for object orientation in three dimensions, quaternions and axis angle. Quaternions actually have a few advantages over rotation matrices, but are beyond the scope of this video. Axis angle, as the name suggests, consists of specifying an arbitrary 3D vector and using that as the axis to rotate about. But for now, we will just start with using the YXZ Euler angle representation. So first, we need to apply the rotation about the Y axis. So between translate and scale, a transform is equal to GLM rotate with the transform as the first argument and rotation.y as the second argument. This specifies the angle to rotate by in radians, not degrees. And finally, the axis of which to rotate around. So for the y-axis, we have a VEC3 with values 0, 1, and 0. Now let's copy and paste this line twice. 
for the two remaining axes. Update the rotation angles to use rotation.x and rotation.z, and then update the axes so 1, 0, 0 for the x rotation and 0, 0, 1 for the z rotation. To summarize this function, we use the current property values of the transform component to construct a combined 4x4 affine transformation matrix. This matrix applies a scale transformation followed by a rotation about the z-axis, a rotation about the x-axis, a rotation about the y-axis, and finally a translation transformation in that specific order. Finally, scroll down and update game object by renaming the transform 2D component type and member variable to just be transform component. Now, there are a few small changes we need to make for the engine to be 3D. In the model header file, update the type of our vertex position property to be a VEC3 rather than a VEC2. Don't forget to also update the attribute descriptions whenever you make changes to the vertex struct. So at the bottom of the model implementation file, we need to update the position attribute descriptions format to be three components rather than just two. This can be a tricky thing to debug if you forget to do so. Then in the app implementation file, we are going to add a temporary function for creating a cube model. This can be copied from the paste bin link in the description below. Copy this and for now, just paste it in above the load game objects function. Next, um, let's start this bit again from scratch. Clear out the load game objects function body and then create a new variable std shared pointer with type LVE model called LVE model and set that equal to create cube model with LVE device as the first argument and use glm vec3 zero as the second argument. Then create a game object with auto cube is equal to LVE game object, create game object. And set cube.model to LVE model. Next, set cube.transform.translation to 0, 0, 0.5 and cube.transform.scale to 0.5.5.5. The reason we need to do this is that the view volume spans from x equal to negative 1 to positive 1, y equal to negative 1 to positive 1, and z from 0 to 1. Only the objects that are within this viewing volume will be displayed to the screen. So these transformations shrink the cube to half its size and move the cube to be centered within the z 0 to 1 range. If we left the cube at the origin, then the front half of the cube would be clipped, resulting in some pretty crazy output. Finally, make sure to add the cube to the list of game objects with gameobjects.pushback std move cube. Okay, next the simple render system needs updating. So open the simple render system implementation and start by changing the transform property from the mat2 type to the mat4 type within the simple push constant data struct. The offset is now baked into the transform with the help of homogeneous coordinates, so we can remove this field. Despite the cube having per vertex colors, I'm not going to delete the color property yet because I think we may use it again in the future. Then scrolling down, let's fix up the render game objects function. Change this line that updates the rotation value from each frame to instead update the rotation.y component. This should make it so that our cube object rotates around the vertical axis. Then remove the line setting the push.offset field, as that no longer exists, and update push.transform to equal object.transform.map4 function call. And now the only remaining thing to do is to update the vertex and fragment shader. Start by opening simple shader.vert and change the first line declaring the vec2 position attribute to instead be a vec3 position attribute. Then update the push constant struct to match what we now have in the simple render system class. So make the transform field a map4 type and remove the offset field. Don't forget that field ordering here matters. Now, because we are using homogeneous coordinates, we no longer need to separately add an offset value. So this line becomes gl underscore position with a capital P is equal to push dot transform times vec4 open bracket position comma one. So this value of one here is the homogeneous coordinate. 
If you are transforming a direction vector, then this should be the value 0 instead. Finally, I want to use a per vertex coloring rather than one color for the entire object. To do so, we need to add an output from the vertex to fragment shader. So just like we did in tutorial 6, under the input attributes add layout open bracket location equal to 0 closing bracket out vec3 frag color. And in the main function body, set frag color equal to color. Copy the push constant layout struct and then navigate to your fragment shader and paste it over the existing struct declaration. Then we need to add the fragment input attribute with layout location equals zero in vec3 frag color. Finally, just set out color equal to vec4 frag color comma one. Now build and run your code. Make sure your vertex and fragment shaders were recompiled. And if everything's working correctly, you should have a rotating multicolored cube. To make things a bit more interesting, open the simple render system implementation and duplicate the line that updates the Y rotation. Let's make the cube also rotate around the X axis, but let's say at half the speed. I'll build and run again and we finally have something that appears 3D. In the upcoming tutorials, we'll improve on this by adding better lighting and using a perspective transformation. One final change I'd like to make is back in the game object file, we can optimize the map for function. This function will be called pretty frequently, once per frame per object, so we want to avoid unnecessary calculations if possible. Using these rotate functions is needlessly complex since rotating about an arbitrary axis is much more complicated than a rotation about x, y, or z. For calculating the algebraically simplified rotation matrices, Rather than doing it by hand, the Euler Angle article on Wikipedia has a table of rotation matrix products for the various possible orderings. Finding the entry corresponding to our current rotation order, we can then multiply it with our scale and translation matrices to get an optimized calculation for the transformation matrix. I've created a pastebin link with the solution where you should be able to copy and paste this function over your existing map for a function. If you build and run your code, visually nothing should have changed, but behind the scenes, fewer calculations are being performed. Now, it may be a bit difficult to intuitively tell which angle values correspond to which orientation. A concept that has really helped clear things up for me is intrinsic versus extrinsic rotations. So far, we've been treating each elemental rotation as extrinsic, meaning that the axes x, y, z of the original coordinate system are assumed to remain motionless. So the object is rotating and the coordinate system remains fixed. We can see this with the cube, where we first rotate around the red x-axis, then we rotate around the green y-axis, and finally we rotate around the vertical z-axis. Depending on what you are trying to solve, this can be a good way to look at things. The alternative is intrinsic rotations where the coordinate system moves with the moving body, changing the orientation of the axes after each elemental rotation. One way to remember this is to think of the coordinate system being inside or attached to the moving object. Sometimes this can be a more intuitive way to approach setting an object's orientation, especially if you're familiar with yaw, pitch, and roll. Take an airplane model for example. The yaw angle sets the plane's bearing, so the direction it is heading. The pitch angle sets the elevation. Is the plane's nose pointing up, down, or neutral? Finally, the roll is like setting the tilt, or how sharply the plane is turning. And the really cool thing is we're actually already using this. The angle ordering we picked is not inherently extrinsic or intrinsic, and is kind of left up to our own interpretation. To interpret the rotations as extrinsic, read the rotation transformations as occurring from right to left. So in this case, we first rotate about the fixed global Z coordinate axis, then about the fixed X axis, and finally about the fixed Y axis. However, to interpret the rotations as intrinsic, all you need to do is read the rotation transformations as occurring from left to right. So first, rotate about the Y axis. 
Then rotate about the object's new x-axis following the first rotation. And finally rotate around the object's resulting z-axis from the second rotation. This is such a cool duality and I wish I had time to go into a bit more detail of why this is true. But for now keep this in mind as a really useful tool for understanding Euler angles a bit more intuitively. So in this tutorial, we've changed our engine to use three-dimensional positions, as well as homogeneous coordinates with 4x4 matrices. We are now rendering a cube with per-vertex coloring, but have not yet applied a perspective transformation, so things might not look quite right yet. When using homogeneous coordinates, the last component indicates whether a vector represents a position or a direction by respectively using a 1 or a 0. The most commonly used orientation representations are Euler rotation matrices, axis angle, and quaternions. In our engine, the transform component represents orientation using the Y1, X2, Z3, Tate, Brian, Angle, Extrinsic Ordering Convention. However, any extrinsic rotation ordering can simultaneously be interpreted as an intrinsic rotation ordering by reading the rotations as being applied in the reversed direction. Anyway, thanks for watching and keep on coding. Cheers.